Our speaker this morning is Kay Warren. She and her husband, Rick, were the first two members of Saddleback Church, and uh, it's just exploded. She is also the author of this great book called Say Yes to God. We have 16 copies of this uh, for free. If you want to, if you'll tag a friend on the Spiritual Life Instagram page, first 16, we'll get a copy of this book. But um, something you may not know about Kay is that she's actually a member of the Lancer Nation because she was a student here when it was California Baptist College. How about that? So I asked Rick this question when he was here last year, but is it true that Rick, because we always want to hear the other side of the story, but is it true that Rick really asked you to marry him on Palm Drive on your first date? Eight days after our oh, first date. Oh, okay. I got it really so wrong. So close to our first That's date. That's right, yeah. We've so been to Farrell's, <laughs> then the Palm Drive, <laughs> then the chicken coop, that converted chicken coop that was the prayer room that we asked me to get. Wow. All that. Wow. So don't rush into anything, right? <laughs> um, I want you to welcome Kay. You are, you are in for a real treat. A powerful message this morning. Would you welcome Kay Warren to CBU? It is great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this so much, especially to know it's your first chapel back after Christmas break, and um, so it's ready for a fresh start and new stuff, and I'm so glad to be with you. There is a passage of scripture that has pretty well captivated me for more than a decade. It's a verse in the middle of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34, and it's just one of those verses I can't get away from, so I keep coming back to it over and over. Let me read it to you. Simple verse with profound implications for my life. Jesus is Talking about him, it says, Then he, Jesus, called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It, it's not a complicated scene. Jesus is talking to a crowd like he does every single day. By that point in his ministry, Jesus was the go-to miracle man. And there were crowds, thousands of people that followed him. And mostly they were people who were desperate. Desperate people who needed a change in their health, who needed a miracle, who needed something different. And they heard that Jesus could raise the dead, he could heal the sick, he could bring hearing back to those who couldn't hear, he could bring sight back to the blind. He was a miracle guy, and thousands were desperately looking for something, and so they followed him. But Jesus points out that day that, yes, there's a crowd, but he said, there's also, I want you to come and look at my disciples. So he divides the people there into the crowd and into the disciples. And he draws a line, if you will, in the sand and says, listen, there are so many of you are in the crowd and you're following me because you're desperate and you need a miracle or you're just kind of fascinated by my parlor tricks or whatever. But there's another group that are my disciples. And I want to tell you the difference between them, he said. The difference between the crowd who is looking for something from me and the disciples who have declared that they are my followers are three things. He said, my disciples are those who have denied themselves, who are willing to take up a cross, and who are willing to follow me. Well, this morning, there is a crowd here. I mean, there is a crowd. And many of you, if we could, you know, just peel back the layers and look into your heart, look into your soul where you're at, some of you are interested in Jesus because you're in a pretty desperate place. And in fact, if some things don't change, you're not sure you're going to make it. You need a miracle in, in your academics. You need a miracle in a relationship. You need a miracle in your health or in the health of somebody you love. Man, you're in a desperate place here today. And you're kind of looking around at Jesus because you've heard that he's somebody that sometimes does miracles that changes things completely. And some of you in this crowd are also what might be called disciples. You've, you've committed fully to Jesus, to the best of your ability. And Jesus here this morning, I think, wants to talk to both groups. He wants to talk to those of you that might just be in the crowd, mildly interested or not even very interested. What would it take to move you from being just somebody in the crowd to being identified with being one of Jesus' disciples. Well, he doesn't leave it. There's nothing ambiguous about how to do that. Jesus makes it crystal clear. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, if you grew up in church as I did, you may have heard a thousand sermons on this verse, and you're already going, heard that, know what she's going to say, don't have to pay attention, I'll think about my next class or whatever. And I would just beg you to just give me a few moments just to let you hear it maybe in through a lens that 
maybe you haven't heard before. Because what has captivated me about this particular verse and the way that it has changed my life is that I have taken some of those maybe old Bible words that we don't really know what to do with, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, and I've added some words that for me encapsulate what Jesus was saying about what it means to really be a disciple. And these, this is what I think he's saying. I think he's saying, listen, if you want to be my disciple, you have to make a dangerous surrender. You have to become seriously disturbed. And if you do, you will become gloriously ruined. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. The New Testament talks about deny yourself. Well, that's a really cruddy place to start because, frankly, I'm not interested in denying myself. You probably aren't either. None of us are interested in things that require us, why in the world would we do that? Why in the world would I deny myself? Most of us are not particularly into that. We're not into this whole idea of surrender, even though we sing songs about it. Those are great words that fit in a worship time in a chapel. But to actually live that way is a whole different thing. And when Jesus is talking about surrender, he's talking about saying yes. When you deny yourself, you're saying no to yourself and yes to God. Well, as Americans, this is not a concept that we like at all. Americans are not happy with the idea of surrender. I mean, we're the people, we're the country that if we go to war, I mean, we're going to be in it to the end. We're going to stay until we finish. We don't surrender. We expect other people to surrender to us. So as a nation, the idea of surrender is not something that we like at all. Or maybe in the picture in your mind is actually more of that of law enforcement, police officers chasing down a criminal who is running, trying to get away, and the police officers are able to corner that person in such a way that the person has no choice but to go, I surrender, I give up. Again, unpleasant connotations. Or maybe for you it's even more personal than that. Maybe for you you're somebody who's experienced bullying in your life and you have very distinct memories of your elementary school or junior high or high school when you were bullied when there were people stronger more powerful than you who made fun of you who mocked you for whatever reason who took advantage of you and you even have memories of those the sense of of cowering at least on the inside to get away from people who were trying to make you surrender who were trying to make you less than we don't like that concept of surrender. It is incredibly negative to us. But I want to tell you that in God's vocabulary, the word surrender is probably the most beautiful word. The words, I surrender, I say yes to you, God, those are probably the most beautiful words that God ever hears from us and touches his heart more than anything else we could ever say to him. But for me, in my life, there are at least three reasons that I have really struggled with this idea of surrender. It doesn't come easy to me. I'm standing up here talking to you as though it's easy. It's not easy. It's really difficult, and it's been challenging. And I think maybe some of the things that have challenged me might also challenge some of you. The first is comfort. My own personal comfort gets in the way of me denying myself and saying yes to God. I call it being the, the queen in the kingdom of me. And every one of you lives in the kingdom of you. And you're the omnipotent king or queen in the kingdom of me. And in the kingdom of K, man, I do my best every single day to make sure that my life is comfortable. That everything that I can possibly do to make my life more comfortable, more suited to me, is what I do. If I get next to a stoplight, I have this expectation somehow that that stoplight's going to turn green. And I get a little annoyed if I actually have to stop. Um, if I'm looking for a parking place in front of, of the mall, I want there to be one close. I, I'm not interested in having to park, you know, several rows away. And there's even somebody that inside of me is like, well, what's up with that? Why do I have to park so far away? It's because I am ultimately interested in making life comfortable for me. When I come home from work and my husband has also had a busy day, I'll be honest with you, I am much more interested in him listening to me and let me tell him about my day and what's gone on in my life and what I'm thinking about than I am in listening to him and his story and his day. And that is the way we roll as human beings. We are generally all about our own comfort. Well, so instead of saying no to ourselves, we are all about saying yes to ourselves. You deserve it. You should have this. You've had a hard day. You've had a hard week. You deserve it. And we're all about comfort. 
The other thing that's gotten in my way is control. I'm a bit of a rebel. I, I, there, I have to tell you, there's a perennial three-year-old in me that is constantly standing up going, no, make me. You can't make me do that. I don't have to do that. I don't say that, but it's in my attitude. It's in my heart. I just don't really want anybody telling me what to do. Any other, anybody else can identify with that feeling? Oh, thank you for the few honest. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's right, because that is also so much a part of our human nature. We just don't want anybody telling us what to do. Well, that's going to get in the way with God. Believe me, that's going to get in the way with God. Because if I am so interested in doing what I want, the way I want it, I don't want God telling me what to do either. And so that can interfere. We can actually become addicted to running our own lives. And that addiction to running our own lives will directly stand in the way of denying ourselves and saying yes to God. And Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to move from the crowd to being someone who is clearly my disciple, you're going to have to get good at saying no to yourself and yes to me. Well, the other thing that stands in the way many, many times in my life is fear. It's a little more nuanced. It's not quite as obvious as that rebel attitude where I'm like just making it clear I like my rules, but I don't like yours. Um, it's a little harder to spot. It's a little more hidden in our hearts. But again, if we could just truly be honest with each other, have a, a conversation where we told each other our stories, you would hear me tell you that somewhere in my upbringing, I developed a fear that if I fully said yes to God, if I completely said yes, if I surrendered my life in the way that I think Jesus is asking, there was a deep fear in me that God would crush me, that I would be crushed by his will, that everything I was so afraid of happening would instantly happen. Like he's up there in heaven, rubbing his hands together, waiting for that moment for one of us to say, I surrender, so that he can just like unleash all these hard things, all these painful things, all these things that we've said, oh God, please don't ever let that happen to me. It's that kind of thing that when you're in bed at night and your, your head's on the pillow and it's just you and God and the universe, the world has quieted down, you're not doing your work, you're not studying, you're not talking to other people, it's just you and God and your pillow. And that's when that fear sometimes can just snake its way into our heart and we get afraid of God as though he's the enemy, as though he's the one who's out to get us. And what that fear has made me do and may make you do is play this deal or no deal game with God. And it's like this, God, I will love you and I will serve you and I will follow you as long as nobody in my family ever gets cancer. I will love you and I will serve you as long as you let me marry this guy. If you will let me date that girl, if you will give me the career that I've been working for, if you will give me the academic success that I'm trying for, God, if you fulfill my dreams and my ambitions and my goals and my aspirations, I am yours. But God, if you don't, then all bets are off. And we act as though we can play a deal or no deal game with God. And we act as though he is out to hurt us, that he's out to squish us beneath his mighty hand. What a travesty. What a misperception of God. When we withhold parts of ourselves, when we start saying, okay, I trust you, but, but okay, I'm going to put this relationship back over here. It's out of, just stay away, Jesus. Okay, this is going to be back here. And my dreams and my aspirations for my life, I'm not sure they're what you want, but it's really what I want. So I'm going to put them over here. And as long as you don't touch that, I will follow you. We don't get to do that with God. That's not the way it works. And moreover, God is good. God is not out to get you. Beth Moore says that we withhold parts of ourselves from God because we, we fear that if we give them to him, that evil will come. She says, listen, evil will come because evil will come. This is a broken world. And those who have not withheld any part of themselves from God will find him to be the help and the strength that they need when evil comes. I can, I can verify that. I've had breast cancer. I've had melanoma. 
My daughter-in-law nearly died of a brain tumor a few years ago. My son, my Matthew, my youngest son died from suicide five and a half years ago. Evil has come into my life and it has broken me. But that has not come into my life because I said yes to God. And because I did not withhold even my son from God. When evil touched my life, I have had what I have needed from God to get through evil. And that's the assurance that you have. Evil will come because this is a broken world. Evil will not come when you say yes to God. It will come because it comes because this is earth. And those who have fully surrendered, who have made a dangerous surrender of themselves and their lives and their careers and their relationships and their aspirations and their goals and their dreams and their families will have what they need because God is good. C.S. Lewis in his Chronicles of Narnia depicts God as Aslan. You know this is that fierce, majestic lion. And one of the characters seeing Aslan, this fierce character, one other character asks another one, is he safe? Do you remember the answer? The answer is no, he is not safe. But he is kind and he is good. God has all the power in the universe. That's why it's a dangerous surrender. We make a surrender to a dangerous God who is good. A God who can fling the stars into space. We like a God that has the power to heal. We want a God who can answer our prayers, who can meet our deepest needs. We all want that kind of a God. We want him to be powerful on our behalf. But we don't like it when that same God has power that can shift our lives from here to here in a moment's notice. That becomes a little scary to us. But underneath, he is good. And he can be trusted. And so my question is just to echo the question of Jesus. Where is God asking you to make a dangerous surrender to him? Where is he asking you to deny yourself, your comfort, your control, and your fear so that you can say yes to him and move from the crowd with their very shallow level of understanding of Jesus to that of a disciple? Well, Jesus asks, he doesn't stop there he, because he doesn't just say, I want you to deny yourself. He also says, I want you to take up your cross, what I would call become seriously disturbed. See, again, think of this, of the scenario, because this is a real story. This is not a parable. This is not some made up story. This is a real encounter that Jesus had on a given day. On a given day, he was talking to a particular crowd and his particular group of disciples who were with him at that moment. And I can just sort of see in my mind's eye that as Jesus is talking to this crowd and he's trying to explain to them, to challenge them to move from that shallow place to that place of real commitment, he's already told them that they have to deny themselves. And then I just wonder if out of the corner of his eye he didn't look and, and, and see a man walking by carrying a cross on his way to his death. And Jesus, knowing that that's what he had come to do, if he, knowing that, did not then look at that real life man carrying a cross to his death and say to these people that he was trying to challenge, listen, if you want to be mine, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to be willing to die. You're going to have to be willing to take up a cross because nobody took up a cross unless they were going to die on it. So when commentators spiritualize that and say, yes, we all have to live, you know, sacrificially and we all have to live, um, you know, for others besides ourselves. Yes, there's truth to that. And sometimes people will say, well, you know, I grew up in poverty, so that's my cross to bear. Or I, I had a really bad family and that's my cross to bear. Well, there's some truth to that. But listen, Jesus understood in his day that a cross was not a piece of jewelry around your neck. It was not a Bible bookmark. It wasn't a cross that you, that you put on your wall. It wasn't a tattoo. A cross existed for one reason only, and it was to die. It was to kill somebody. And so when Jesus looked at those folks and he said, if you're going to be mine, you have to be willing on some level to give your very life if I ask it. Man, that was tough stuff. But he could do it because 
He was setting that example for us. He was in heaven with God where the angels did his bidding. He, he was the creator of the universe. He had all power and all might. And Jesus became so disturbed by my brokenness, by the fact that I didn't have a relationship, that I was hopelessly lost, that you were hopelessly lost. Jesus became so disturbed by our need that he left heaven to come to die to pick up a cross and die. And he's asking that of us. He's asking us to become as seriously disturbed as he was, so disturbed by what is happening in our world that we would be willing to die if necessary so that others would know of Jesus. I mean, that's some powerful disturbing He chose to be with us. He didn't just talk to us from afar. He chose to come be with us, and he chose to die for us. So those who are in the crowd and are going to make a move from being in that place to that of a disciple, you're going to have to do some business with God on some level in which you say to him, if you ask my life, if that's what it means to follow, if you ask my life, I will give it. When I became an advocate for people living with HIV about 15 years ago, I didn't know anything about HIV. That's a whole other story of how that happened. But I will just tell you that I was completely ignorant. And I thought that by coming an advocate for people living with HIV and AIDS here and around the world, that I might be exposed to the HIV virus and that I could become sick myself and die. It was ignorant because HIV is not transmitted easily like that. But I didn't know that at the time. And so when I said to God, you're calling me to be an advocate and to care and to call the church to care for people living with HIV and for the orphans, and if in so doing I also become sick and die, my life is yours. Ignorant prayer, but so sincere. And so I have to ask you, what is it that disturbs you? Jesus was disturbed so much so that he left heaven and came to be with us. Pay the ultimate price for us. Where is it in your life that you are seriously disturbed? Does anything of significance disturb you? Or are you so caught up in the moment of where you are in this time of your life that you don't even give a thought, really, to all the things in this world that are worth being disturbed about? See, what most of us are disturbed about are, my favorite team didn't make it to the playoffs. And we are disturbed ruminate on it think about it we're angry we are just ticked off brokenhearted our favorite dancers get voted off dancing with the stars and so you think you can dance and we all we can do is talk about it because this is a big deal or we get disturbed by the price of gasoline or the price of chicken or how much tuition is going to i mean we get disturbed by things that are about this big when in our world There are 163 million children who will go to bed tonight without a mom and a dad. 163 million children in our world are orphaned. There are more slaves alive in the world today than have ever existed at any other point in history. There are people in America who will go to bed tonight hungry. There are homeless people outside of this gate, outside of this property, outside of this campus that are going to be covering themselves with cardboard tonight as the rains come. There's systemic racism in our country. There are people who are treated as though they are dirt. There is so much. There are mentally ill people who will be put in jail rather than given treatment. Suicide is the number two killer of college students. You guys, there's so much to be disturbed about in our world. And most of us close our ears, turn the channel, act as though all of that doesn't matter. And instead, we put our our little bits of energy into things that don't matter. And Jesus is talking to the crowd. He's talking to some of you and saying, will you let me get in and dig around, root around in the soil of your being, root around in the soil of your mind and your thought and your heart, And disturb you by what needs to disturb you in this world. So much so 
that you're willing to leave your comfort zone, your comfortable life, so that you can, as Jesus did, offer, if necessary, your very life. Because if you do, if you make a dangerous surrender of your life to Jesus Christ, if you let him seriously disturb you, I'll tell you the outcome. The outcome is that you will become a gloriously ruined follower of Jesus Christ. Now, on the surface, that may not sound very attractive, but I will just tell you that I am a ruined woman. I'm ruined. I'm ruined for life as it used to be. I'm ruined for life as most people live it. I'm not always very much fun at dinner parties because you know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about people's needs. I want to talk about what the church should be doing about people's needs. I want to know about what the church is going to do about issues of justice and injustice. I want to talk about the things that are disturbing in this world because I am a dangerously surrendered and seriously disturbed and gloriously ruined follower of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be ruined? Because that sounds really bad. Well, let me tell you this. It means, I think, that there has to be a willingness to follow Jesus to the end of discipleship, wherever that leads, whatever that is. It says, I don't care where it leads. I don't care where the end is. I just know I'm in it. And I'm in it till the end. I will go where you lead. I will do what you ask. I will pay whatever price you ask. And to allow Jesus to get in below the water line, you know, polar ice caps or icebergs, you see about, you know, this much above the surface when you see pictures of them. And then you see the other pictures that show that beneath the waterline, there's massive, massive mass of ice. And that's the way our lives are. What we see of each other's lives is, you know, about this much. Because under the waterline of who you are is who you really are and what you really think and what you really believe and what you really do. And Jesus wants to get in under the waterline and change your passions and change your pursuits. Because here's the deal, you guys. Most people in the United States are in some way, shape, or form pursuing the American dream. The American dream, health, wealth, and happiness. Some of you right now are already in earnest of that pursuit. You are earnestly pursuing your slice of the American dream. Health, wealth, and happiness. And I want to tell you, as somebody who has had a little life under her belt now, the pursuit of the American dream in and of itself will ruin you. Flat out ruin you. But so will following Jesus Christ to the nth degree, to the end of discipleship, to the wherever it leads. That will also ruin you, but gloriously ruin you. And if I'm going to be ruined, I want to be ruined for a kingdom that lasts. For a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Jesus preached an upside down kingdom. He preached a kingdom that was not built on the strong and the powerful, but on the weak and the powerless. He did not build a kingdom that was built on beauty and affluence. He built a kingdom on the wounded and the poor. He didn't build a kingdom with those who were the most likely to succeed, but with those least likely to succeed. He didn't build a kingdom from those that are at the top of the heap, but those at the bottom. He didn't build a kingdom based on those who were at the center of it all, but those who were on the periphery, who were on the edges, who were on the margins. He didn't build a kingdom from those who were already the insiders, but those who were on the outside. In Luke 14, 12 to 14, Jesus says, when you put on a dinner, don't invite your friends, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will repay you by inviting you back. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And then at the resurrection of the godly, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. God has always been about the least and the last and the lost. And the fact is, most of us are not 
about the least and the last and the lost. We do not have the heart of God. We are not willing to let him disturb us. We are not letting, willing to let ourselves be ruined. But to follow him is to let him ruin you. I was in Russia a few years ago, and I met a, a young girl, Ira. She was 15 at the time. Ira had been raised in an orphanage, been abandoned by her family by the time she was a baby. And when I met her, Ira told me that, that she had been told every day of her life in an orphanage, you don't matter. <laughs> Nobody cares what happens to you. Nobody cares. Look, you're abandoned. You don't matter. And Ira then, based on that information, grew up one tough little girl, and she was constantly in fights. She fought the boys. She fought the girls. It didn't matter. Ira took her life in her hands, recklessly fighting. She was drinking. She was an alcoholic by the time she was 10 or 11. She had sold her body for sex. And so at 15, though Ira stood in front of me saying, but I love Jesus Christ. I've met Jesus Christ. And I said, Ira, how in the world, how in the world did you go from being a girl on the street who aged out of the orphanage, fighting, drinking, selling your body? How did you end that from there to where you're saying now you love Jesus? She said, Peter and Masha, a young couple, started coming to where a lot of us street kids hung out on the streets of Moscow. And they invited us to their flat. And every day they would come and, and Masha would fix spaghetti and tomato sauce. And they would let us play games, and they would listen, and they, we could listen to music. And they kept telling us that, that God loved us. And I would say, oh, yeah, God loves me, all right. He loves me so much, that's why I'm an orphan. That's why I've been abandoned. Sure, God loves me. That's why those men have taken advantage of me. Yeah, God, he really loves me. But over time, as Ira was in Peter and Masha's home every day eating spaghetti noodles with tomato sauce in the warmth of a Moscow night, being with somebody who was telling her, though, after a while, Ira said, I began to believe that if Peter and Masha could love me, then maybe the God that they were talking about could love me as well. She said, I gave my life to Jesus. How did Ira, this abandoned orphan girl, ever know that there was a God who cared about orphans? How did she ever know that there was a God who cared that she had been abandoned and abused? How did she know? She knew because Peter and Masha dangerously surrendered, seriously disturbed, and gloriously ruined followers, disciples of Jesus Christ, set the table both literally and spiritually for Ira to know God loved her. Colossians 1.15, and I'll close with this. It says there that Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God. Listen, our world does not understand God. And that's because we, those who are the containers of Jesus Christ, make him invisible. And we need to get up every single day of our lives as dangerously surrendered, seriously disturbed, gloriously ruined followers who are back in the world making sure that that invisible God is visible so that the broken, the poor, those who are struggling, those who are suicidal, those living with mental illness, those who are hurting, those who have been abandoned and abused, mistreated, know that there's a God of compassion who cares for them. If you don't know what to do with your life, if you don't know what to do with your life, let me tell you, I can give you the answer right now. Make the invisible God visible through your life every day. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for these brothers and sisters. Some are in the crowd, some perhaps not even really interested in you, but may this day, hearing that there is a God who loves, who is not forgotten, who is intimately cares for them, be attracted and drawn to you, Jesus. I pray for those sitting in the middle of the fence, those who are kind of just lukewarm, those who are in the crowd and they've come to you, but they don't really know what it means to surrender to you. May this be that day. Oh God, use us to make you visible to a very broken and wounded and hurting world. In Jesus' name.